welcome back for the third installment of Dogs in Our World. This episode is about dogs and philosophy. Join the audience at dogsinourworld.com and tell us what you think in either the contact page or episode comments. Also, I could really use some help with these iTunes comments. I need a certain amount of reviews before new listeners can find us more easily. So, it would be a huge help if you could please leave a rating or comment in iTunes or wherever you get your podcasts. Okay, we have a lot to cover today. So, let's put on our thinking caps and get started. You are listening to Dogs in Our World a show that explores the history, science, and importance of the domestic dog. Here's your host, Adam Winston. Dogs help me, well, they help me, but they also help me grasp difficult subjects. They also give me the confidence that I need to conquer challenges. What do I mean by that? Well, I mean that the only way I've been able to confidently approach the world of, let's say, philosophy and maybe understand a little bit of it is by looking to domestic dogs as examples. So since this show is about meeting experts and getting answers from the source, I searched the Internet for someone who could teach us about dogs and philosophy. And with the help of my old philosophy professor back in Philadelphia, I found this guy. Okay, so I'm Stephen Hales. I'm professor of philosophy at Bloomsburg University of Pennsylvania. And a few years ago, I edited a collection called What Philosophy Can Tell You About Your Dog. And it was published with Open Court. Okay. So that's sort of my background in writing about dogs and knowing about dogs, other than having owned many dogs. You sound like the person I've been trying to find and talk to. <laughs> so this is Thankfully, great. Dr. Hales is a teacher who utilizes various subjects in order to help shed light on philosophy. I think that philosophy has something to say about many uh, areas that people have interest in that they don't really recognize philosophy has something to say. And to to see that, to see that, hey, you know, maybe these philosophers can illuminate some aspect of this topic that uh, is already of interest to me, whether it's dogs or cats or drinking beer or whatever it is, um, that that brings something to people. And brings it out of the ivory tower. And I think that has some value to it. So that appeals to me, too. And that's what we want to do today. With the help of Dr. Hales, we're going to bring a bit of Philosophy 101 out of the ivory tower. And if you've you've never taken a philosophy class, great. No big deal. Um, If you're interested in visiting the subject with a fresh approach, let's see how the dogs in our world can help teach us something new. Our experiences with them as pets and uh, companions is an avenue, to, an avenue to reflecting on a lot of different philosophical issues. I mean, the nature of friendship, for instance. I mean, is it that dogs can genuinely be our friends or is it a different kind of relationship that we have with them, one of guardianship or something else, right? Uh, because you think part of what it is to be a friend is that there's a certain reciprocity where they, the, where your friend acknowledges or recognizes that you are their friend, right? Well, do dogs have that or not? Well, I don't know. Maybe this is something that we can think about. Or um, the how it, how it is that we have obligations, what kind of obligations to non-human animals like dogs? Do we have a special obligation because they are our dog, where I have a certain obligation to, to my a golden retriever mix Sophie that I don't have to other kinds of dogs. Okay, well, why is that? Right? I mean, if they're all the same kind of creature, why do I have special obligations to Sophie? Well, it's because I have a kind of relationship with her, a kind of life with her. And so maybe our moral obligations are uh, sort of a p- particular and specific and relative in this kind of way, and they don't hold very generally. So, I mean, that's one kind of idea. Uh, or the, the understanding of the minds of dogs. Is it the case that they really do have affection for us? Or is it they're merely, we interpret their actions and their behavior as showing affection and that they've learned to imitate this in a kind of way through evolutionary history in order to basically live the good life with us, right? Or is it genuine affection and how can we tell? So I mean, all of those are philosophical questions. Uh, 
I wasn't joking about this guy, right? Dr. Hales. He has made me think a lot about dogs and philosophy lately. In fact, it's been difficult to figure out exactly how to share everything he taught me in just this one episode. So, as usual, I like to start at the beginning. And when many people think about philosophy, they usually think about the classic or ancient philosophers, such as Plato and Confucius. I asked Dr. Hales if any of those first philosophers ever mentioned dogs. Yeah, it's a good question. I, I really can't think of any particular instances. Well, actually, no, let me take that back for a moment. There was some discussion among the ancients um, about the use of whether dogs could reason logically. Um, so not so much dog minds or, or, you know, the ethics of dogs or, you know, that kind of thing. But uh, whether or not they were able to reason, in particular, use logical syllogistic reasoning. So could they reason from, you know, uh, everything is such and such. This thing is a such and such. Therefore, I can conclude something else. Uh, so uh, there was actually a uh, debate with uh, King James of England, of uh, Bible fame, where he considered this matter, it, there was kind of a, a debate at Cambridge University about whether or not dogs could reason. But this does, in fact, go back to the ancients. Uh, so if they're chasing a rabbit, let's say, and the trail divides, and they start heading down one branch of the trail, are they actually reasoning that the rabbit is not down the other branch? Do you see what I mean? Yeah. So, and if that's really a kind of use of logic, the rabbit is either down trail A or down trail B. It's not down trail A, therefore it must be down trail B, right? Are they engaged in that kind of logical process? So that was, um, yeah, and there, there is some ancient discussion of that. Rene Descartes of the 17th century, he was a French scientist, mathematician, and philosopher. In fact, Descartes is often referred to as the father of Western philosophy. When I was in school, I read about his views on animals as being what were called beings of automata, you know, automatic, like machines. As I continue learning about animal wel welfare, I often see people making associations between the Descartes view, or as philosophers say, the Cartesian view of animals, and how they are treated today, industrially today. Professor Hales, however, gave me more to think about when it comes to this. So one of the things philosophers have worried about for a really long time is what is it that separates living things from non-living things? And how are we supposed to be able to figure that out? Well, some kinds of things look a lot like living things, but they're not alive. And so in Descartes' time, people would have these kind of really intricate mechanical devices, right? Not just clocks, but other kind of clock-like mechanisms, uh, the mechanical Turk, right? This kind of stuff. And so they could mimic, in a way, living functions, but they weren't really alive. So the question is, well, how should we understand non-human animals? I mean, is it that they have minds like us, or do we think, look, maybe they're just kind of biological machines. Yeah, okay, they're alive, but they're not – they don't have mentality the way we do, All right? How could we tell whether things really have a mental life or not? So these were the issues that they were grappling with. And Descartes, yeah, he's famous for the idea that, well, look, I think they're just kinds of clocks. And to the response that, well, look, if you were to poke one, it would flinch, right? So, I mean, doesn't that indicate it feels pain? So, so, well, no. I mean, that could just be a kind of response. I mean, worms will curl up if you touch one end, but that doesn't mean that they feel pain. In fact, they probably don't. They don't have enough neurological capacity to feel pain. We moderns don't think this. But so this is – these were really live issues during Descartes' time. And, you know, do you think any of those thoughts from that time, from any of those uh, philosophers, have an effect on our view or our society's view of animals today? Well, I don't really think that you could find anyone who's prepared to uh, defend the, the kind of Cartesian idea any longer, that, you know, they're really just automata. I mean, it's a big planet. You'll probably find somebody. I'll take that back, right? Um but among professional philosophers, we think, well, all right, we understand why that view had its day. But, you know, now we've sort of moved on past that to try and especially post Darwin, seeing human beings and and dogs and other animals as all part of a kind of continuum as opposed to fundamentally distinct kinds. Any other thoughts you have about uh, the, the ancients and their thoughts on animals? Yeah. 
I can't really think of a lot of other ancient discussions about non-human animals because, you know, back at, during that time, animals were either regarded as, you know, things that you, did work for you, right, um, or they were things that you would hunt or they had some kind of – that kind of relationship to human beings. Or, I mean, obviously with the Egyptians, I mean, they could be somehow – connected into objects of worship, right? Uh, Bestet, the cat goddess, right? Or Anubis, the jackal-headed god, right? And that kind of thing. So you'd have those sort of complicated relationships, but not in the way that philosophers nowadays think about our relationships with non-human animals and with dogs and so forth. Gotcha. Uh, I mean, I did like the kind of logical uh, reasoning thing that you see in, in Chrysippus and, uh, you know, so, some of the other uh, ancient logicians. But it's an interesting connection, although I think even in the case of you know, industrial farming, I don't think the farmers themselves, the ranchers, that they're thinking about a, a Cartesian view of animals. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. It, uh, so, uh, and it's more like their critics are the ones who are rejecting that view and have sort of given that more consideration. All right. So there we have it, a little taste of philosophy history. Coming up after the break, we're going to take a brief look at just a few schools of thought and have Dr. Hales give us some dog examples in order to introduce us to such fields as ethics, epistemology, and something called metaphysics. Adam will be right back with more Dogs in Our World. For more information about this show, visit the episodes page at dogsinourworld.com. And be sure to subscribe to us on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, and SoundCloud. And welcome back. Today, Professor Stephen Hales from Bloomsburg University and author of What Philosophy Can Tell You About Your Dog. He's uh, providing us with a 101 crash course in order to help us better understand a little philosophy and dogs. Uh, philosophy is comprised of many various schools of thought. Dr. Hales shared with me a few of those branches of philosophy that can be used to examine the dogs in our world. Some of the obvious choices are ethics, right? You know, what are our relationships with dogs? What are our obligations towards them? Do dogs have rights? What, you know, how can we understand any kind of duties that we have to dogs? Do they have duties towards us, right? So that's one end of it. Also the philosophy of mind, you know, how should we understand dog mentality? What kinds of thoughts do they have? Do they feel emotions and to what extent? And, and what does that mean about their minds? Is it the case that they think that we have minds? <laughs> wow. Are you interested in animal rights, animal welfare, or maybe even enrolling into a philosophy class? Well, maybe you should check out ethics. Uh, you can also do some research on the philosophy of mind, which Dr. Hales was just talking about. Here's another one. Epistemology is the theory of knowledge. And pe people who study the theory of knowledge are interested in, you know, what what does knowledge consist in and that or how should we what's the nature of understanding how is that distinct from knowledge and yes definitely people have uh, epistemologists have thought about that in connection with dogs and connection with uh non-human animals so for instance if you say that you know something typically what you know is that some claim is true some statement is true right so if i say look i know the sun rises in the east i'm saying Look, I'm connected up with the with the proposition, the claim, the sun rises in the east, and I am affirming that it is true, and I have some other kind of connection to it that makes it knowledge. Well, maybe dogs don't have that. Maybe they're not connected up with sentences or statements or propositions. So maybe they don't have knowledge in that kind of way. But what they do certainly seem to have is knowledge about things. They know that things have certain qualities. They know about them that they possess properties. And maybe that sort of knowledge is distinct from the knowledge that propositions are true. You see what I mean? So some people have worried about that. Oh, um, technically, this is the de, de dicto de re distinction, but you know we'll forget about the, the technicality part. Of it. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. I mean, it doesn't really matter. But but the idea is that dogs have this knowledge about things that they that they have certain qualities. Maybe they don't have knowledge about propositions that they are true. And so people have kind of uh, tried to think. Can we make good sense out of that distinction? And how are those two different kinds of knowledge related to each other? So, Could you give maybe a little bit more of a dog example? A dog's... <laughs> right, yeah. right. Okay, so let, let's say the dog knows um, about the bin that it contains her food. So she knows that the bin has the property of containing her food. 
All right, she'll go and look at it if her bowl's empty or something like this. <clears throat> and that seems maybe it's a different sort of thing uh, from knowing a proposition that the bin contains her food. She may not have uh, the idea of sentences that could be true, right? Even though she has the idea of the bin as being an object that has qualities. So I know it, it seems that's, like kind of a subtle and technical good. distinction, no, but that's, that's one of the yeah. things we worry about. <laughs> you, you gave me a dog version. That's what I needed. Oof. Are you still with me? Yeah, good. I know we're, we're, we're starting to get a little deep here. Uh, don't worry. I, I'm not a philosopher either. And if you are a philosopher, then, uh, I don't know, let me know if you have any questions about dogs, all right? Uh, okay, I just, I just want to have Professor Hales give us one more lowdown on another branch of philosophy. Uh, it's one of his favorites, uh, his philosophical bread and butter. I think also, interestingly, in metaphysics. So, and what is metaphysics? Okay. Uh, okay, so metaphysics is interested in the fundamental nature of reality. And, and let me give you a kind of example uh, connected up with dogs. So think about dog breeds. So is it the case that there really is such a th thing as a Weimaraner or a Shih Tzu or a Beagle or, you know, a Golden Retriever? Are these distinct classes of things that are in the world or are they just kind of convenient categories that we have come up with? And OK, so what, what should we think about dog breeds? Is that just a kind of convention that we've got going or is that really a real kind of a break in the world between different um, types of dogs? Are you so, I guess, so then help me, ex maybe help me explain, uh, understand this. So, are, you know, are we saying that just like when I tell my dog training students, um, you know, I know you're looking for a certain breed because you assume this will be, it'll be this kind of dog. But remember, every dog is different. There are, there's a mm -hmm. wide variety of personalities, even among the different breed groups. Please don't think, you know, I've, I've, I've known hunting dogs that don't hunt. I've met working dogs without a job, you know, um, right, right. is this kind of touching on that? Yes, exactly. That, that's exactly right. So it, it might be the case that, I don't know, a wire-haired fox terrier has more in common with a Great Dane than two D Great Danes do to each other, other than physical appearance, right? But behavior and, you know, interests and, and sort of, uh, you know, general dispositions, right, that kind of thing can happen, as you just said, right? Okay, so why is it that we, we say, look, wire-haired fox terriers are a very different kind of thing than Great Danes? Because they don't look very similar. Okay, that's fine. But if we think about, okay, suppose we cross a, a fox terrier and a Great Dane. Okay, we're going to call that a mutt, but why isn't that a thing in itself? Why isn't that its own kind of classification? Like a labradoodle. Like a labradoodle or a golden doodle. Exactly right. Right? I, I and now that. people think that's a real collector dog or whatever. You know? But to other people, it's a mixed breed. It's a mutt. That's correct. That's exactly right. So why do we think that some kinds of dogs are mutts, but other kinds are not? Is that is see, and that touches on the one idea man's of, designer is it a dog is another man's mutt. Right? right, right. So why is that a real division in the world, or as opposed to just a kind of a convenient labeling system that we've got going? And if you think it's just kind of a convenient labeling, where okay, I'm going to say golden doodles, they're mutts, but you know, standard poodles, that's a real breed. Why? Because you want to pay more for AKC registration? I mean, that's what matters? I mean... Mm -hmm. <clears throat> All right. I'm having a conversation with a philosopher about dogs. You have no idea how awesome <laughs> this is for me. You really have no idea. <laughs> uh, I was just introduced to metaphysics, right? Isn't that cool? After the break, uh, I'll start to lighten it up a bit and give us some more practical ideas and personal examples that we can think about when looking at dogs. Dogs in Our World with your host, Adam Winston, will return right after this. <laughs> okay. Support Dogs in Our World by making a donation. This fun and informative show is free to the public, but it's not free to produce. Every dollar donated goes directly towards production expenses. Help Adam improve the lives of dogs and people through more episodes just like this one. Donate today at dogsinourworld.com. Welcome back to episode three, which is all about philosophy. 
not long ago, various outlets such as Modern Dog Magazine, PBS, Huffington Post, USA Today, and a bunch of others all had articles about whether dogs can feel guilt or shame. Uh, in fact, it was these kinds of stories that gave me the idea for this episode, which then led me to Dr. Hales. Essentially, in order for dogs to feel guilty, many argue that they must then have a sense, sense of, of self. self. What, <clears throat> what, what does that term mean? Well, I mean, I think that's a difficult question to answer, uh, right? Whether a sense of self really amounts to the recognition of your own identity or personality as distinct from others or whether you see yourself as look i'm just part of this collective i'm just a part of of, of this particular pack let's say i'm not i don't see myself as an individual apart from that identity um so or to be able to have a kind of metacognition on your own thoughts right where i can think about what my ideas are and recognize them as belonging to me as opposed to sort of passing elements in my mind like perceptions right what if i see something or hear something in what way is that my seeing it or my hearing it and so self-awareness could can constitute or, or be comprised of being a, recognizing that as belonging to me as opposed to just a, a, a thing that is passing through can i can i think that dogs have a sense of self well, right. I mean, and, and I think that this, again, is something that, you know, for us to try to consider and try to figure out whether whether they see themselves as um, as individual agents who make their own choices or who engage in certain kinds of activities that they recognize as belonging to themselves, things that they have ownership in. This is something that I did or whether they don't, right? Or whether they just, well, here's things that I do. I see that we're part of a pack together and that we sort of collectively act, whether they see themselves as separate from that. You know, it, it seems to me an open question. And the reason I ask this question is because this has been brought up recently in something I've read. A, a, f a few outlets have, have published something and I'll have to look for it if we have show, for the show notes here. But so talking about, does your dog feel guilty? That guilty look they have on their on right, yeah, face, exactly. you know, are they feeling that? Like, um, do they feel shame like we feel shame? Because then I must know that I did something wrong and I know that I, I'm, I must have empathy towards someone and I must feel bad about what I had for a decision I made or an action I made. Um, so that means I know what I did and that's a sense of me, a sense of self, right? Right. No, and, and I think this really ties into these problems of, of how we're to understand dog mentality as the, what I mean is, is it the case that dogs have learned to uh, show certain kinds of um, subservience, which we interpret as a guilty expression because we imagine ourselves in their position. If I had just torn up the couch and then dad comes home, I would look pretty guilty, right? I would be hanging my head and, you know, I'm expecting the beating or whatever the yelling at or whatever is going to happen here. Have dogs merely learned to demonstrate that behavior, but that there's not really the mental correlate of the feeling of guilt or shame that we would have? Or is there also that feeling? Do you see what I mean? Mm -hmm. We interpret them as having that feeling. We say, well, look, the dog clearly feels guilty. I mean, look at her. You know, I mean, she's hanging her head. She's sloping, sloping around, whatever, you know. And, uh, or is that really a kind of and anthropomorphizing from our own experience, our own internal experience. Can and you, I, can I, you define for the listeners? Because I always hear that word and I remember that uh, it wasn't long ago that I didn't know that word. What is anthropomorphizing me? <laughs> right, right. It, just the idea of attributing human traits to other things. Right. Okay. And, you know, clearly dogs do have many human traits, but how far can we push that? There's some human traits they don't have. They are never going to master calculus, right? Okay, so they're going to be forever closed to, to figuring that out. Um, well, do they have human traits like shame or love? Or is it the case that they're just engaged in behaviors that we interpret in that manner? Right? And I think these are really hard questions that I don't think have obvious or clear answers or an easy way to test. How about your dogs? You've had dogs. Did your dogs ever have that guilty look on their face? Oh, sure. Absolutely. Uh, you know, 
had that guilty look on their face or that kind of excited look, how, how proud they were that they did something where, you know, you didn't really want them to do that. I didn't want you to kill that squirrel and leave it on my front step, even though you clearly have this look of pride. Yes, I brought home dinner, right? Um, did my dog feel pride in that? I, I don't know. And I, I don't know how to judge that. I mean, maybe she did, you know. Uh, <clears throat> but I think it's even the case with these problems arise with fellow human beings as well, right? You see somebody else engaged in what seems like contrition. Well, are they really sorry? Maybe they're just faking it, you know? You know, it's like, boy, say you're sorry to your sister. Oh, I'm sorry. Well, is he really sorry? You know, I mean, and maybe the dogs like that too. Another thought that I often ponder and uh, which led me to this episode is the idea that there are bad dogs. I often have people tell me, Adam, my dog is really naughty today. Uh, it's also difficult sometimes to honestly explain to people that they're the ones that chose to live with an animal and should take more responsibility for their behavior. Then again, I have also been called a hippie when it comes to dogs, so... Let's see what Dr. Hales has to say. Are dogs naughty? <laughs> right. Well, that's a good question. And I think there's, it's obvious that we interpret them as being naughty, right? That they've done something bad. That, and I don't know. So I'm thinking of my dog. My dog, Sophie, if we leave the house and leave the bedroom door open, she thinks she's entitled to go up and sleep on our bed, which she is not entitled to do. OK, but, you know, if I come back early for whatever reason, she thinks I'm gone for the day, but I just went to get the mail and I come back. You know, I can see her running down the stairs. Like, what? I wasn't on your bed. I, I don't even know what you're saying. Right. And giving me that kind of experience. She knows she's not supposed to be there. She's not just lying in the bed waiting for me to discover her. She knows she's not. But. Would I interpret her as being naughty? I mean, in one sense, yeah, sure, that was a naughty thing to do. But was she uh, culpably bad? Well, I, I don't know. That's maybe when it gets a little bit murkier to me. What you know, mean maybe she's bad. What What I mean is, can I really blame her for having done it? Do I think that she has done a bad thing for which she should be punished or disciplined? She, in her mind, may think, "Look, this is just a game. Run back downstairs before the master realizes I'm on his bed." Right. <clears throat> I don't know. Um, as Please opposed know, to, you I, know, I if I were to, I need you to know. <laughs> yeah, right. Yeah. Right. Well, I do too. I mean, <laughs> where you think, look, if I know for sure, she knows that is the wrong thing to do where, okay, look, Sophie, you're in trouble this time. Right. Um, and we're going to have to, I mean, she was kind of a C minus student at dog obedience school, but whatever, uh, uh, where, you, you think, OK, here's some kind of um, consequences for getting on my bed again. You know, as uh, if I were sure that you were aware of this as bad behavior, as opposed to simply something she should get away with if she can, because it's just a game. Yeah, I don't know. While uh, reading through some of Dr. Hale's book, uh, which, again, is titled What Philosophy Can Tell You About Your Dog? I came across a section about dogs uh, embarrassing humans. Um, I've seen it. A dog has an accident or overreacts unexpectedly to something, and their human then overreacts or turns red and apologizes to everyone. Of course, we should all be considerate and respectful of others when out with a dog, but why the embarrassment? Well, I, I mean, I, I think part of the answer to that is, we're embarrassed by certain kinds of behavior from whatever source, right? Or we think that we are somehow responsible for the behavior of our dogs, including behavior that we would find embarrassing if done by ourselves or, or a member of our family. And of course, many of us regard dogs as members of our family, right? They're not just hanging out in our house eating our food. I mean, they're members of the family. And as such, we think that behavior that our children would engage in that we would find embarrassing. But when the dog does it, oh, it's just it's like my child. Well, when the dog does it, it's embarrassing too. Although 
when we reflect on it, it seems pretty weird to be embarrassed by things that dogs couldn't control, wouldn't even understand that they need to control, and you, I don't think you could train out of them. Um, <clears throat> so, yeah, I mean, I, I think it's our, our natural intuitions about what would be embarrassing in the context of our families sort of bleed into our engagement with our dogs. Hey, maybe you've never been embarrassed by a dog's behavior. Maybe you don't even like dogs. Uh, either way, I, I think there's some value in what Dr. Hales just said. I'm going to remember this last soundbite the, the next time I find myself tempted to maybe judge a stranger based on their dog's behavior. Maybe they rescued that dog an hour ago. You know, maybe it's the dog's first day with a sitter. Who, who knows? Maybe I simply take all this stuff too seriously. <laughs> That's definitely possible. Uh, but hey, look, after the break, uh, we'll begin tying some of this stuff together, and Professor Hales will share some personal thoughts. We'll be right back with more dogs in our world. Be sure to connect with us on Instagram, Facebook, Twitter, and Pinterest. You can also message us directly via the contact page at dogsinourworld.com. Don't forget to subscribe to the podcast on iTunes, Google Play, Stitcher, or SoundCloud. As we enter the final part of the episode, I want to explore just a couple more questions that I had for Dr. Hales and share with you something he said that I think applies to everyone listening. I know some of the questions I have about dogs are impossible to answer, but it still doesn't stop me from asking. And remember back in the uh, first episode when I was talking with Eric Wilbur at Wolfhaven about um, if dogs see us as one of the pack, I asked Dr. Hales um, how he thinks dogs see us. I'm not sure. And it's very difficult to get inside their minds. I mean, that's, that's one of the challenges here is to try to see, look, do they, as I was saying earlier, do they even view us as having minds or are we just things that interact in their world, you know, that move around in kind of predictable ways or do certain kinds of things for them? Or do they see us, view us as having intentions and plans, right? I'm, I, I'm not entirely sure. I, I don't think they see us as dogs, Right. In the same way that they don't recognize other kinds of animals, animals that they might encounter as potential dogs. I mean, my dog knows squirrels. Definitely not dogs. Right. Cats. Totally not dogs. There's not a mystery about it. It's not like, OK, you're an alien dog. You're, you're not part of my pack. No, you're definitely not even a kind of dog because, you know, you can see them react differently to stranger dogs than they do to stranger cats, let's say, or stranger porcupines or whatever you unfortunately encounter. Dr. Hales shared his personal thoughts on why he thinks the dogs in our world are special. They've kind of thrown in their lot with us, right? And they see us as being engaged in this kind of mutually beneficial arrangement, right? We take care of them. They'll do a little work for us or they'll bark at intruders or whatever, but we, we or they'll show us some affection. But we've got this kind of uh, reciprocal arrangement with domesticated dogs that we don't have with wolves. Now, again, whether we should view our dog's behavior towards ourselves as constituting genuine affection, really the, the signs of it, right? I mean, that's one of the things that people debate. I mean, for my own part, I think that, that they do have at least somewhat similar emotions to our own. And once we come to view human beings as on a continuum with the other living things in our world, as opposed to somehow unique and fundamentally distinct, then that picture makes a lot of sense. I mean, that they should have emotions or at least nascent emotions uh, that are analogous to our own. Why do you think dogs have such an effect on our lives and cultures? And, you know, what makes dogs special to us? Well, I think one of the things is that we enter into these kinds of relationships with dogs and they show us a kind of unconditional, usually a sort of unconditional enthusiasm for our presence and for our participation in their lives. They always want to 
go play ball or go for walks or whatever it is, or they're going to come in the same room with us and we're reading the paper and they'll lie down at our feet and just want to be with us. And unlike cats, let's say, right? Your typical cat, not that interested in those sorts of things, but the dog is. And it's that kind of um, feeling that you have engaged another creature that shows an interest in you and wanting to be with you and do things with you that we may not get with other human beings. We may not get with our own children. They may be like, dad, I'm taking the car or whatever it is. And you know, they don't want to hang out with you. The dog wants to hang out with you. Right. And there's something powerfully attractive in that. As Dr. Hales and I began to wrap up our conversation, I asked him what ideas and questions he would like us, you and I, to spend a little more time thinking about. And he kind of blew my mind. Um, look, guys, listen, listen. If you, if you listen to one sound bite in this episode, please take a moment well, and I, marinate I, I, I on this. Probably most people haven't thought about one of the topics we were talking about earlier of you know the issue of dog breeds and whether or not there's real differences among them and that kind of thing, which, which I think is a, a useful exercise. And it's one of the things that people who talk about uh, race with respect to human beings also think about, right? Is there a real difference among races or is that, again, just a kind of convention that we came up with, right? Um, and, you know, and, and I think that, uh, trying to sort those things out is really interesting. Now, metaphysics is one of my areas of interest. So maybe I just alone find this particularly interesting. Dang, man, that is deep. For those of you who have a dog, uh, Dr. Hales has another request. I, I think it'd be great if people have a bit of reflection upon their interactions with their own, with their own pets, with their own companion animals, where they think, okay, look, what exactly is the nature of the relationship I have with this dog and how should I under, understand it as another kind of creature in my world? I mean, it's not another little human, even if I treat it as a child, right? And some people do, right? But, but I know it's not, but why? What's distinct about it? What's different? What makes those dogs different from us? Not simply a, a matter of their species, but is it a matter of their mentality? Is it a matter of their behavior? And, and what does that Im imply about how it is I should interact with them? And just trying to see them as both strange and familiar at the same time. And I think that's one of the interesting, um, hopefully things that philosophy can bring to that is making the familiar strange to us and showing what's sort of wonderful and, and, and surprising and just hidden in the ordinary familiar uh, things of our lives. Dr. Hale's book, it's like a, it's like a leaking dam. It needs to be plugged. <laughs> what philosophy can tell you about your dog, uh, available through Amazon, available through, you know, uh, your local bookstores, I would expect. And where several different philosophers uh, examine all kinds of different topics about dogs and our, our lives with dogs and the nature of dogs, whether dogs can reason logically, uh, what's the nature of dog friendship, you know, are you really friends with your dogs? Why is it your dogs are less annoying than your children, but liable to embarrass you as much as your children? So how can we make any sense out of that idea? And <clears throat> why do we reject the kind of classical Cartesian idea that dogs are automata? Why do we now think that they have uh, minds and they're not just kinds of fancy clockworks? So all of those questions are uh, addressed in that book. And, and hopefully, you know, people can find something that grabs them as, oh, that does seem pretty interesting, and I want to think about that some more, so. All right, great. And as this uh, show gets off the ground and progresses, do you think I can ever call you again if I have questions? Sure. I know you could sure, answer. Sure, absolutely. Yeah. All right. That was great. Man, wasn't that cool of Dr. Hales to come on the show and drop some knowledge on us. What's the takeaway from today? Well, I want you guys to think about something that interests you. Maybe you're not into dogs. Maybe you don't even know what you're passionate about. But think about how you can use something that interests you as an example to better understand something else like philosophy. Something that can be intimidating or simply new. For me, I'm passionate about dogs. And it's fascinating how my interest in them now sheds light on paths, or as Dr. Hale says, avenues to areas of new subjects and personal discoveries. 
Uh, maybe I just, as I said, take this stuff too seriously. Who knows? What do you think? Could you let me know how I did today over at dogsinourworld.com? I'll see you next month.